Press. Hello, can you hear me, Corridor? I can hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Oh, okay. You broke up quite a bit. Sorry, are you at work? At no, work? I'm home. All right. Good to see you. All right. Uh, let's start uh, today's conversations. Uh, last week we started on um, on a new theme titled 20 laws that guarantee marriage without tears 20 laws that guarantee marriage without tears and for a quick recapitulation as to some of the things that we covered we said the very first law is the law of deliberate work, that making marriage work is a function of deliberate work. But we went ahead to expand on the fact that it's not just random work, but tailor-made work, uh, customed work. In other words, that we should move away from just loving and loving our spouses the way we want to that place where we begin to love them according to how they want to be loved. Uh, Dr. Gary Coleman calls it speaking their love language. Then we talked about the fact that uh, if there are gonna be any changes to be made, let the focus be upon yourself to make changes to your personal attitude. It is such key because each time we think we want to change the other person, we become judgmental and the pressure of trying to change the other person begins to make living with us a difficult experience. Then we talked about uh, making yourself a marriage maker as against not becoming uh, what you call a marriage hunter or a marriage challenger or uh, a marriage uh, a drifter, or what we call the prema premature marriage minder. Yeah. You should become a marriage maker. It is skill, and thanks be to God that the skill can be learned. You know, so, uh, uh, okay. So we advise everyone, learn the skill. But I think the biggest home run was in that number one law that we should endeavor to customize love according to what the person we are relating with really wants to see. You know, because I think the next day my wife sent me a little uh, uh, video clip of a drama that was put together in one of those churches where she went to minister. You know, and it was such a beautiful drama because the man, uh, you know, you know, spends a lot to make sure that his wife gets everything material, cars, uh, everything in the house, make sure that there's money in her account and all of that and all of that. And yet the wife was saying, you don't really, really love me. And the man goes crazy, like, what do you mean? And the woman said, uh, there's, no, there's, no, uh, there's no dress in my wardrobe that you bought. And the man was screaming, but I'm the one that gave you the money with which you bought all those clothes. And she said, yes, you may have given me the money, but what stops you from going to the market to buy it for me? Do you know the size that I wear? And it turned out that the man couldn't guess uh, her sizes because he has never had to look for, shop for her. You know. So the point to be made is don't just do it the way you want. Find out how the other person wants it to be done. And in the, uh, in the scriptures, God calls it uh, working in obedience. He said, obedience is better than sacrifice. Just do what I've said than for you to go into elaborate uh, sacrifices. So those were, the, those were the much we were able to cover last week. And then we had also a very fruitful uh, interactive conversation. Today, let's, let's pick it up from there. Uh, 
Our next law, which will be law number five, is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11. The scripture speaking says, when I was a child, I speak as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Please understand this, that the building up of a marriage is a function of your speech. The building up of your love life is a function of how you talk. You could have been attracted to someone because of their biceps and, you know, uh, six pack, or you were attracted to your wife because she was so pretty. She was the most beautiful doll, uh, you know, uh, on the street or within the block. You know, no matter what brought you two together, the building up of the relationship, the building up of the marriage, the sustainability to cultivate the relationship from acquaintance to intimate, from intimate to a fulfilling marriage is a function of what you say. And the scripture here says that we should be very, very careful because the ultimate proof of how you think about your spouse, the ultimate proof of how you understand your spouse is found in your speech. What you really think about them is found in your speech. What you really understand about them is found, is traceable in your speech. And the apostle here writes and said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. Because marriage is not for children. But you see, being mature is no longer a function of age all the academic qualifications that we have, all the, the title, you know, in clergy or spiritual, you know, activities that we carry. No, no. They are, this was the apostle speaking. He said there came a point in time that he had to put away the immaturity. He had to put away even that childish behavior. If you don't put it away, you can't outgrow it. If you don't put it away, it will stay with you, stay on you, and you will be judging every other person to be wrong. Meanwhile, you are the problem to yourself. If you look at the sequence in which he described his speech, he talks about speaking first before understanding and before even thinking. But when you mature, you take time to think, process your thoughts, understand the implications of what you are saying before they come out of your mouth. That is the only way you can ensure that you say what you mean and you mean what you say and you use what you say to build what you have. You use what you say to build what you have. Please hear me. If we don't go too far because of this particular law, um, I, I'm gratified. Please hear me. The blood of Jesus on Calvary's cross by itself is not what saved you. The Bible never said it's the blood that saves you. The Bible says that it is when you believe with your heart in that blood, what the blood has done. If you believe with your heart, the matter is not finished yet. He said, then you confess with your mouth. It is the confession. It is the speaking that activates what the blood has already done as a latent, though perfect covenant. It's in the same way. How is your marriage conducted? Your marriage is not a function of the ring you wore, whether it was uh, 24 karat, or it's just a ring from uh, a Coca-Cola uh, can. No, 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 no. Your marriage is solemnized by the vows, the words you said to one another. 
It is the vow that solemnizes you, not the certificate. The certificate is evidence to show that you have taken the vow. It's the vows that marry you, not the ring, not the certificate. So in the absence of the ring, you can be married. In the absence of a certificate to sign, you can be married. I think there are even some churches now that don't use rings. Instead, they give gifts of Bible. So that the, what is exchanged is not the material that marries you. No, it is the vow. It is the vow that marries you. And once those words have come out of your mouth, the Bible says you are snared or you are covenanted by the words which you have spoken. It is the words that marry you. But guess what? It is the words that continue to build the marriage. It is the words that you say to one another that continues to build the marriage. Before we started the meeting, we were praying from Psalm 141. Let's go back there. Psalm 141 and verse number three. Psalm 141. This is the king after God's own heart, David, who is showing us this prayer. And in his prayer, he said, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. What David is saying is this. I found out that my words are so critical to my destiny. My words are so imperative to my relationships with people. So, oh God, I need you to act as a sentinel. I need you to act as a security watch guard to keep the door of my lips, to stand as filter over my mouth. Mount yourself as sentinel, as guard over the door of my lips. Don't let any nonsense come out of my mouth. Whatever will destroy my partner, don't let it come out of my mouth. Whatever will destroy my children, don't let it come out of my mouth. Whatever will break up this relationship, don't let it come out of my mouth. That's what he was saying. Please hear me, please hear me. Uh, this is a king who is talking, okay? If anybody should be braggadocious, it's a king. Okay, and, and these were the days where the, when the monarchs didn't require any democratic uh, election. They, didn't, they did not receive uh, uh, whether that staff of office from, from, the, from the parliament. No, no, no. So even in that time, when, when kings were as demigods, David said, oh God, I can't let my mouth do what it wants. I cannot afford to allow my mouth to do what it wants, to say what it wants to say. I can't. It will destroy what I'm trying to build. If I allow my mouth to have a free course, if I speak the way I feel, I will destroy what I'm supposed to be building. I can't help myself, he says. So, oh God, you come and be a guard over my mouth. Be a sentinel, be a watchman to keep the door of my lips. Don't let it open anyhow. Just like a gate man, you come to the house and they ask you, yes, who do you want? Then they'll scrutinize you and decide whether they will let you in through the gate or let you or not let you in. And so David said, oh God, do that kind of a job for my mouth and watch over my lips. Why? Why was he, why was he, so desperate to have the almighty God watch over the door of his lips. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 18. It's a very familiar scripture, but we'll take it from the part where you're not very, where you're not too familiar with. You're familiar with verse 21, but let's take it from verse 19. Let's take it from verse 19. Proverbs 18 from verse 19. The Bible speaking says, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. Please hear me. The Bible is trying to show you the near irreparable damage that your words can occasion. If you, if you want to know what the Bible calls a strong city, think about Jericho. 
Jericho was a strong city, a city that had a wall surrounding it, its, its total perimeters. Everything was within the walls. They didn't have a housing estate outside the walls. Outside the walls, there were farmland. But the whole city, the residence, the government house, everything was within the walls. And those walls were so thick that chariots could ride on top of them. So any man who is within those walls, it is difficult you know, to break through and go and get them. And then the Bible says, in a comparison, that a brother offended. How? With words. A brother offended, a spouse offended, is harder to be won than for you to wage an attack against such a city like Jericho and win. Please hear me. Uh, these are not my words. These are God's words. And please hear what God is trying to communicate to you. Each time you say to yourself, I just want to say what's on my mind. Be careful. Be very, very careful. Be very, very careful. Each time you just feel like, uh, but I just want to vent. Be very, very careful. The cost of your venting. But pastor now, once I've said it, even my parents, they know me. All my life growing up, my vexation doesn't last so once I've said it, then the matter has finished. It has finished from my mind. Yes. But have you not noticed after it has finished from your mind? So is what was on the ground. The relationship is finished. Then the, the, the other person becomes the offended brother that is harder to be won than to take a, a strong city. And then in your own response, you keep thinking to yourself, ah, what is it now? Okay, so when you now said that what I said is what hurt you, didn't I tell you I'm sorry? I'm sorry to announce to you, according to God's word, your I am sorry sometimes is not enough to remedy the damage that you have done. Learn how to put a watch over your mouth. Learn it. Nobody is your slave because they love you. Nobody is your slave because of marriage. Nobody is marrying you so that you will use your mouth to destroy them. That is not part of the vow. When the Bible said, for better and for worse, worse was not supposed to come from you. It was a commitment that you and I will stand together when worse comes against us from outside. Not that you will be the one occasioning the worse. Let's be careful with our words. Let's be careful with our words. In verse number 20, <laughs> no, look at even part B of that verse 19. It says, that, that brother who is offended, their contentions are like the bars of a castle. What is the Bible saying? When you have used your words to offend your lover, don't let it shock you when they build barricades to keep them away from you. Listen, listen to what I'm saying. This has nothing to do with this thing affects preachers. I've heard over and over again, great, great, great preachers, orators, that when they speak from the pulpit, ghost people will be all over you. But when you hear them curse their loved ones at home, you can't reconcile the two. You can't. You can't. Sincerely speaking, Sincerely speaking, how do you explain that somebody who is really, really anointed lays hands on you and you fall under the power? Then you hear that person calling their lover, you are a useless idiot. How do you reconcile those two? How do you reconcile it? And unknown to you, you are crushing your children, you are breaking them up because they just wonder why. Why, why, why are my parents like angels when they're on the pulpit? When they come home, they become like demons. Their God must be a very, very hypocritical God. Why does God use my parents? Can't God see what they are at home? Is God cooperating with them in this, their camouflage? Ah, no, yeah, I can't go with this God. 
And that's how those young children would go after rock music, go after celebrity um, uh, models and follow those ones into the world. Please be careful, be careful. The cut of a knife can be saved with stitches, but the cut of words, the Bible says, it drives the other person so far from you that they'll become unreachable. Please hear what I'm saying. Do you know that there are people who are married and we ask them, how long have you been married? They say, we've been married for like 33 years. That's true, according to the calendar. The reality says their marriage ended almost 18 years ago because of something that was said. And the person that said they didn't know how far that, that offense and that insult was going to go. They didn't know. Please hear me. A lot of people, I, I, I mean, my wife is here. This has been our work for over 20, how many years now? Jemima is now 22, so and we've been at it before Jemima was born. So, so people will tell you, I don't know what happened in my marriage, Joe. We used to be such sweethearts. We used to have so much fun together. I don't know what happened. This is it. Write it down. Your mouth is what happened. Your mouth is what happened. Your mouth is what happened. Goodness in marriages fled because of wrong use of words. Please hear me. I know it's possible that some of us, we came from home where insult, trading in insult was normalcy. You know, so you watch your mother and your father trade in unprintable insults. So growing up, you and your siblings, you guys opened the season two of the same insultive, uh, you know, uh, uh, use of insults. You know, so now you, you've left your home where insults and use of insult is normalcy. Now you've married someone who comes from a background. Oh, Shakala Magata. Somebody who comes from a background of peaceable, you know, uh, 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 um, peaceable, gentle, gentleness, you know, equanimity, you know, everything is soft and respect, you know, courtesy. You know. And now, living with you, you are trading with that person as though your father is still the one in front of you, as though your elder brother that beat you when you were age seven is the one you are retaliating on. And the person is just wondering, like, I'm sorry. I know God hates divorce, but I can't stay here. I got to go. I got to go. And then you're wondering, you come for counseling and say, eh, after I said it, uh, but mama, I, I, I told him I'm sorry. Why is he still going on and know about it? <laughs> I'm telling you, in your family, when they say it like that and they say they are sorry, they all got used to it. The person you are dealing with is not used to it. It's not used to it. And don't make anyone to get used to it. It doesn't work that way. Please. When we say marriage has broken people, it is not the institution that broke the people. It is the words, harshly used words, that broke that person. That's what broke that person. You see people eventually become obese in their marriage. Why? They gave up on their self-admiration somewhere along the line because the spouse in the place had reduced their, their self-worth with words. I'm coming out strong this time because I want to hold you accountable. I want you to know that God is holding you accountable for what your words are doing to your marriage. He's holding you accountable. So don't wait till you die and you face judgment. Fit Judge yourself this time. Judge yourself right now. In verse 20, see how, see how, see how the power of words work. It says, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruits 
of his mouth. So there's a connection between your wealth, your affluence, the way people love to give to you. It's connected with how you use words, how you'll be satisfied. You look forward to just coming home. You see, looking forward to coming home is not a function of what you are going to, uh, let me put it like this. There is no home to go to if those who are there don't want you to come home. If when you are out, that's when they have peace. They don't want you to come back home. You, you, you have no home to go to rejoicing. It is not the mansion that makes those that live in it happy. It is happy people that make a mansion out of where they live. They say a man shall be satisfied, a man's belly shall be satisfied by the fruit of his lips. Then he says, and with the increase of his lips, he shall be filled. In other words, if you take this thing very, very seriously, you can retrace your steps from today. You can still recover some of the things that have been lost in that relationship. If you can just trace them to what you said that cut them off. Find out what you said that cut him off. Find out what you said that made him to stop kissing on you. Find out what you said that made him to lose interest in even making love to you. Find out what you said that made him to stop giving you money. He used to be so generous with you. Trace your words back. And then when you find what you said, repair it and then go on the increase saying the right thing. And the Bible says, as you go on the increase saying the right thing, you will also enjoy increment in the relationship. Why? Verse 21 that you and I were familiar with. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Whether you are a preacher, laity, or sinner, unbeliever, infidel, it is the same thing. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. It's in the power of the tongue. The death of your marriage is in the power of your tongue. The life of your marriage is in the power of your tongue. How come we're no longer closed like we were closed before? It's in the power of the tongue. How come we no longer spend time together like we used to spend time together? It's in the power of the tongue. How come you no longer confide in me like you used to confide in me? It's in the power of the tongue. How come nothing I say is funny to you anymore? It's in the power of the tongue. It's in the power of the tongue, people. This is so, 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 so critical. Remember when I did the course with us here, I think it was on communication, I told you words can be padlock and words can be keys. As padlocks, some words can lock people up and they will never be open again. Words of dishonor, they have a way of making people to lock up. You, you shouted on your wife in the presence of your friends and then the following year, you bought her a car for her birthday and you think that all is well with you you are a joker from from you fell from 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 a tree plus your car plus everything you are buying if you don't go back and repair that insultive standoff that you did with her when you rebuked her in the presence of your friends and you reduced her you you you, you are not going anywhere else. You're not going anywhere You're not going anywhere You're not going anywhere so, but uh, you know, I was joking now, and after that, I bought you a car. Cars don't erase those things, brother. They don't. They don't. It's so important. Words can be padlocks. They lock people up. You're talking to someone, and they now make up their mind. Mm. As far as this friendship is concerned, I will never let this person go past here. From what I'm seeing, from what I'm hearing, this is not the kind of person that should go past here with me. They've made up their mind. Why? The words that have been used. Say, Pastor Ken, you are still hammering on this one thing. Time is going. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. This one thing can turn your marriage around, can turn your relationship around. Your words. Your words. Please hear me. Spend a bit less on your fashion and spend a bit more on your words, bam, your relationship will go up. Yeah, yeah. 
spend a bit less on fashion. Pay attention now to your word. It will change your world. It will change your world. Oh, no. I, 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 no holds bad. I'm not holding back. Let me push it a bit further. Reduce your prayer hour. Watch your words. Watch your words. Reduce your prayer hour and filter the words that come out of your mouth. It will turn your life around. It will turn your life around. Words draw hearts close together. Looks draw eyes. You know, fashion and all of that. It creates admiration. It will draw close. But what really keeps the glue are words. That's why when I'm dealing with singles sometimes, I tell them, date with your eyes closed sometimes. Go on the date and then close your eyes. So that your eyes is not the one fully in charge of everything, looking at the biceps, looking at the clothes, looking at the whatever. No, no, close your eyes. Wait for what you hear. What you hear spells the future, not what you see. With that person, when you want to choose who you want to marry, I know I'm married to a cute wife, and I think I'm somewhat cute as well. So she didn't tell you, she went to the market with her eyes open. But that's not what is keeping us. That's not what is keeping us. That's not it. Therefore, diminish your emphasis on the looks, the external features. Close your eyes. Open your ears. Write this down. I said, what you hear is what spells or predicts your future with that person, not what you see. You know how 2 Corinthians puts it? He said, why we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Words cannot be seen. For the things which are seen, they are temporal, subject to change. But the things which cannot be seen, like words, they are eternal. For out of the abundance of their heart, the mouth speaketh. Every tree is known by its fruits. And those fruits are words, not looks. You know, jokingly, uh, when you see long hair now, you have to ask, is this yours or you just uh, added something? Even though I've been told, any hair you see on the woman is hers. Whether she grew it or she bought it, it's still hers. Hallelujah, she can I totally agree. But guess what? There is an aspect that cannot be bought. The character that filters through words. This is the strength of relationships that without tears, without tears, words can heal. Words can re resuscitate what was dead. Words can give life to what was dead. Words, rightfully used words, can recover a relationship where they were already going their separate ways. If they can just start talking again and saying the right things, and saying the right things. So the king said, oh Lord, be a watch over my mouth and be a guard over the door of my lips. Law number two, dovetailing from this particular law, which is the law number six now in the whole lineup, it's taken from Proverbs chapter 20. Honey. Yeah. Sorry to cut in on you, but did you observe something no. that from that verse 19, no. verse 19, verse 20, verse 21, yeah. if one moves to verse 22, yeah. it now feels like the climax of what this king was describing yeah. was that the man that can find a wife, yeah. the man that can find a treasure in his wife, the yeah. man that can receive, receive favor from his, the, the Lord as re, regarding his wife, is this man who knows how to speak awesome words. Yeah. Everything just started like conversation from verse 19, then it goes to verse 20, then verse 21. And in verse 22, it was like God now allowed everything to erupt. This is where I'm going. If you're able to control your words, if you're able to speak kind words, you will find a good wife. It's like you finding a good wife comes from the ability to speak right words and to sustain it. That's just my observation in the way these scriptures are lined up. I, 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 I totally agree with you. I, I, I saw that. 
The reason I didn't add it is that it will put a gender severance in the narrative. It will now make it mainstream. And I didn't want to do that. So you see, I want, it, I want it to be something that both the male and the female, husband and wife, can come to their senses today and take responsibility for what's coming out of their mouth. But, since, uh, but absolutely what you said is a good uh, uh, contextual, you know, exegesis. Hallelujah. You know, oh, this is why it's good to marry a woman of God. <laughs> oh, all right. Now, let's continue. Our second law is taken from Proverbs 25 and in verse 28. Proverbs 25 and then in verse 28. Ha, look at this. The scripture says, He that has rule over his own spirit is like a city. He that has no rule over his own spirit it's like a city that is broken down and without walls. The next law that will make you a marriage material that will marry without tears is the need to sustain your identity without changing in response to the other party's actions. The need, the power to sustain your identity without changing who you are in response to the other party's actions. People say you used to be a very, very sweet person. Then you get married and now they're beginning to notice that you're no longer that sweet. What happened? So when well, I was sweet, but I got married to a crazy person and they kept provoking me and provoking me. So now I had to develop a thick skin. I had to develop, you know, a bad conscience. I had to develop, you know, um, uh, I, had to, I had to survive. And now that survival mode has become my default setting. Please hear me. You can never control what somebody else brings to the table. You can never control how somebody else is going to behave. You cannot determine how people will react to the pressures of life. But here's what the Bible is saying. You have rule over your own spirit, not their spirit. Maintain the rule over your spirit, not their spirit, not their spirit. I keep saying this, the husband that I am to my wife is not a reward to her. I chose to obey God, to do the way he has commanded me. The wife that my wife is to me, I believe to the extent. To a great extent, she is doing it because she loves God. Well, I to speak with him, hello. The beauty of what she and I have is that we are both committed to God. But guess what? Often people ask me this question. How long should I wait for my partner to change when I am doing my part and they are not reciprocating? Please hear me. My wife is here now, so I can say it here. There are things in our marriage that I've had to wait for over 10 years before they manifested. She's here. And she will tell you, you are, you are saying it, I don't understand. If I don't understand, I can't jump on it. But guess what? After 10 years, when she understood it, within months, she overtook me in the same matter. But until she understood it, she didn't jump on it. So how long do you wait? Scripture says, you don't change yourself because of what you get in marriage. Maintain the consistency of the rule that you have over your spirit. Please hear me, my wife is here. It is such self-crucifixion, if not suicide. When people say, I caught my spouse cheating. Now I'm going to cheat to retaliate on them. No, 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 you are not cheating to retaliate on them. You are like a city without walls, a city that is broken down. You don't have rule over your spirit. Why they cheated is a different ball game entirely. But for you to now say your conclusion and response to the matter is, I'm going to cheat too, so that you know how it feels. You never had rule over your spirit. I'm sorry. You never did. 
how will the children ever be protected if we live those lives, if we live such lives? How? Huh? Or you hear somebody say, ah, uh, honey, I was asking you, so uh, what happened to your salary? Uh, are you telling me you blew your whole salary yourself? Oh, so if you can be full in this marriage, okay. Next month, me, I'm going to blow my whole salary. And then you guys start retaliating. You blow June, she will blow July. You blow August, she will blow September. Then you blow October, then school fees will be due. And then it becomes a prayer point. Why? That's not how to marry. You keep the rule over your spirit. Say, so for how long? Please, keep growing in who you are. Keep developing yourself towards God. And always rejoice in your capacity to change and become more Christ-like. It is not a function of reciprocity. This is who we are called to be. The reason a lot of marriages become bitter is this retaliation. But you want to remove the tears? Become a consistent person who is growing in Christ-likeness. Say, Pastor Ken, what are you saying? What I'm saying to us, my brothers and my sisters, is that there is the critical need in this 21st century for you and I to learn on how to connect God's purposes with our pleasures in marriage. We have to learn on how to connect God's purposes with our own pleasures in marriage. So it's not just about you. Please hear me. I know you and I get upset with Adam and Eve, at least from Sunday school studies, that ah, Adam and Eve, that ones that put us in this trouble. Please, now go cinematographic on me, okay? In a cinematographic manner, just sort of, you know, imagine with me that the only family on earth is not Adam and Eve. The only family on earth is you and your spouse and your couple of kids. And now God is relying on you and your spouse and your children to propagate his kingdom on earth. I know you complain that Adam and Eve failed us. What you are doing right now is you're not failing the next generation. If you are the only family elected by God now, husband and wife, Mr. and Mrs. And God said, I'm going to use your family to propagate my kingdom on earth. Will it go beyond, I mean, will it succeed? We never think of it that way. We always have this feeling, somebody else will obey God and transfer his kingdom on earth. Another family will do it God's way, but for us, we'll do it our way. We'll, we must allow our selfishness to have full sway here. Some other person should obey God. It's not true. You are the one that must obey God. You are the one that must realize that marriage was founded by God. For God and for man. Please hear me. In Genesis chapter 1, from verse 21 all the way to 26, we don't have to read it. God entered the fifth day of his creation. And he said, let the waters bring forth all the living creatures in the sea. And then let the birds of the air be created. So on the fifth day, he created all the aquatic animal life. And he created the aerial animal life, all the birds, all the flying creatures, and all the swimming creatures, the, the evening and the, moon and, the, and the morning of the fifth day, and God saw that everything was good. Then on the sixth day, he created the cattle, the creeping things, all the animals that are on the land. Remember, day five, he created the animals in the, in the water, and the ones in the air. Day six, he created the animals on the land. And then the second half of that day, he said, let us make man in our own image and after our likeness. Now, please hear me. Concerning the animals in the sea, he made them male and female, separate genders. Concerning the animals in the air, he made them male and female, separate genders. Concerning the animals on the land, whether the creeping snakes or whatever crabs and all, he made them all as it were male and female, separate genders. When he was creating the man in his own image and after his own likeness, he created one man. Then he came back in Genesis 2.18 and said, it's not good that the man should be alone. Hear me. God intentionally 
created all the other animal world the way he did, then created man the way he did to give us marriage as an institution. So he came and then he now brought Eve out of the rib of Adam and then he said to the man, for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother. Please hear me, God was not talking to Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had no mother or father. He was using them to instruct us concerning what he has just done. This institution that he has just created, which is not available to the other three departments of living animals. Breathing in the same oxygen as us. Gene engineers, bioengineers are about to, they will soon begin to um, um, replace our liver, our kidneys, and even our heart with that of a pig. We are that close now. But God didn't give them marriage. He gave us marriage. And he's telling us how to make it work. Is telling us how to make it work. If we can connect God's purpose to our pleasure, then we'll, succumb, we'll become circumspect in the way we demand for our pleasures. You know, sometimes what destroys us is what I call the clash of our rights, the clash of our liberties, the clash of our self-expression at several, several levels. At the general level of gender conflict, male and female. No, men say it should be like this. Women say it should be like this. Men say it should be like this. Women say it should be like this. Our, our rights, our liberties, our self-expression. Then you come into the homes. Ah, no, 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 no. Who is the head of the home? He, get it, get it, get it. The, the, the man and then the woman about the rights, about the liberties, about the self-expression. But everybody is forgetting the kingdom. The kingdom, which is the set purpose. Remember, God's, God's marriage program gives us three purposes. Number one, companionship. It's not good that the man should be alone. Number two, procreation. Multiply and replenish the earth. Number three, the dominion mandate. Have dominion over all my creation. Guess what? The companionship is about you and me. We are enjoying each other. Procreation is to extend onto our children. The dominion mandate is about making sure that his kingdom is done here on earth, his will is done here on earth as it is in heaven. And it's you and I that have to mandate that. If we fail God, there's no plan B. There's no plan B. And please, let's wake up, smell the coffee. The world has gone so far. The world has gone so far. So the other proponents, the enemies of the kingdom, they are no longer shy about what they do, about what they believe. They are no longer shy. They have a flag for their nation, and their nation has no boundary. Your children can be citizens of their kingdom. You know the nation I'm talking about, the nation that has the uh, rainbow flag. Your children going to church with you can be citizens of that kingdom. We can do better than this. We can do better than this. Yeah. We can do better than this. Let me round up. I'll give her just one more law. Oh, if I can push it, I'll give us two. But let me take one. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse eight. So that we can have a good discussion. Yeah. First Thessalonians. Chapter 2 and in verse 8. Is anybody getting blessed? Is anybody learning anything? Please respond to me well, whether a comment or a sign, your reaction. Please react to me. Hallelujah. You know, are, are you getting blessed? Yes. Honey, are, are you are you waving at me? What are you doing? Oh, okay, like this. I understand this. When you did this, so it, it looked like goodbye. Yeah, Chizoba, thank you. All right, who else? Let me hear your responses if you are getting the yeah. Thank you, honey. I see, I see your thumbs up. You know, uh, First Thessalonians, and in chapter two, chapter two. Ah, we have our young darling, Oprah David Benson. How was encounter? 
you know. Uh, I hear that. I mean, that was a great, great lineup of uh, the old and the new. Mm -hmm. That was beautiful. Thank you, Corey. There, I see your thumbs up. Hallelujah. Okay. First Thessalonians chapter 2 and in verse 8. I know Hadiza is here somewhere. Yeah. You know, and Hadiza has not said anything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 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 Ms. Benson says it was fine. Hallelujah. Praise God. Please hear me. The next law, let's take it from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, so being affectionately, <laughs> so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Write this down. The next law that makes marriage wonderful without tears is the law that says your soul matters to us with laughter your soul it matters to us with laughter and i will explain then we'll start discussing let's take that verse apart and take it slowly it says number one so being affectionately desirous of you in other words i deliberately and intentionally i cultivate my affection towards you i intentionally do it in the olden days before the digital advent we used to put photographs in our wallets put um, pictures in little picture frames on the office tables you know, and uh, hang pictures, you know, around the walls. Uh, just that person you love, even on your car dashboard, you just stick it there. Why? We were intentionally cultivating our affection to go towards that person. So everywhere we look, we are seen unconsciously in a subliminal manner. We are having contact with that person each time. And our parents in those days, if they wanted to go out, if you went into, if you went to a party, no matter how crowded the party is, you could tell the Mr. and Mrs. Why? They would wear identical outfits. They were creating intentional direction, cultivating, deliberately cultivating their affections towards one another. But in the digital era, yeah, we can take the selfie, keep the pictures. I mean, have a lot of pictures with your spouse. Have a lot of pictures with your spouse. If we went into your phone right now, how many pictures are we going to see? Have pictures when you are fully dressed up and ready to go and see Mr. President and have pictures of the two of you just coming out of the bathroom with your, with your shower robe on. But please, for the last ones, make sure you store those ones up, not in the general gallery. Make sure you create an album for them. And if you want to put a passcode, you can put a passcode. But what I'm saying, take pictures lying down together. Take pictures laughing. Take pictures feeding yourself. Take pictures in your playtime. <coughs> Why? You are intentionally channeling and cultivating your affections towards one another. The pictures you have taken, take time to look at them. Let them remind you of the good times that you have had. Let them remind you of the valuable attachment and relationship that, that the two of you have. And so being affectionately desirous of you, he said, now we're willing to have impacted onto you. Please bring your soul on board this relationship. Let it impact. I say to people in our home, you know, um, God has blessed me with a lot of graces. But uh, he didn't bless me with the grace to sing. But when I want to touch on my wife and touch on Jemima and Shekinah, I'll just start singing. Hallelujah. This is nodding her head now. <laughs> and they all start begging me. Just tell us the song. We'll play the CD. I said, no, 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 no. Let me sing it for you guys. You know. Then when I really, really want to hit the home run, I put on my dance. <laughs> I will never forget the day. Adiza was there with us, and we all started dancing, only for her to say to me, Pat, you are streaming live. I said, how? He said, no, I have you going on live. I said, God forbid, how can you be streaming this live? Because we're dancing hilariously. Sometimes you see Shekinah will just be looking at me like, that. what is he trying to do? Those were the days of, is he a Sonto, you know, Skelewu, Skelewu, you know those dances? She's like, 
What are you trying to do? But guess what? I'm just being impactful. I'm trying to make them laugh. What has happened to the laughter in your relationship? I'm a serious-minded person. But when it comes to the home, I want it to be a heaven of refreshment where we laugh, where we laugh. Let me tell you, laughter, the Bible says, and this is from God's perspective of analysis. It says laughter has the same capacity of efficacy like medication. The laughter do it good like medicine. It can heal some things. But how come? The relationship is, no, is now without laughter. No more playing together. No more playing. Some people think that, I ah, know we've grown now. We are more mature. No, 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 no. Even the, you can't be older than the ancient, ancient of days. And the Bible still says, concerning the ancient of days, he that sits in the heaven, he shall laugh. He still laughs. He still laughs. Bring back the laughter to your marriage. Bring back the play to your relationship. If we, are, if we are dear to one another, bring back the laughter. Bring back the playing. My wife and I, we've been married almost 23 years. Guess what? We still chase ourselves all over the place. I have a name for all her body parts. We can be discussing some things right now. She'll tell me, sorry, that person doesn't want to take your call. And you guys are thinking we are talking about the, uh, the Canadian immigration. Now, lie. The person that we are calling you doesn't want to take my call. You sign there. What we are looking for in Sokoto is inside the Shokoto right there. So you can never tell. That's how we roll. That's how we roll. Hallelujah. Why? Keep it light. Keep it happy. Thank God for video FaceTime calls. We can still tease ourselves. We can still make each other laugh. And here is why. He said, do not just impart the gospel of God. Impart your soul. I'm rounding up now so we can discuss. Impart your soul. Stop to say good morning. Stop a bit, a bit longer and say, how are you? And wait even still to get their response. Let's talk these relationships that don't have the simple courtesies or simplistic living. No more greeting. Somebody goes out and comes back. Nobody says welcome. As a matter of fact, you just hear the bell and you turn. Who is it? And somebody goes to get the door. Oh, it's, uh, it's you. Honey, welcome. And you see that. Why? Get up, go give that person a hug. Welcome them. Act like they've gone to the moon, to another planet, and they just returned. Even if they just left the house 20 minutes ago. Celebrate the times that you have together. All we have is this single life. There's no second, there's no part two to it. Enjoy yourselves. Enjoy one another. And it doesn't take plenty of money to do this. All that, all that it requires is that you bring your soul out. Bring it out. Let them enjoy you. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed and we have preached. Amen and amen and amen. I think I got to stop here. Thank you, Jesus. I got to stop here so that we can take. Amen, amen, amen. Well done. Okay. My in-law. Ah, oh, my in-law is here today. Good to see you, Sister Joker. <laughs> and your best. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Good to see you. All right, admin. Thank you. Good evening, Even... sir. Good to be here, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> How are my children? <laughs> they are fine, sir. Thank you, well, very Thank you well. so much. I really enjoyed this, sir. Thank you so much, Phil. Thank you for coming, uh, Oprah David Benson. Thank you. Honey, uh, could you help us in the Q&A? Thank you. Thank you. Well done, honey. Well done. Really, really eye-opening. I mean, I've never seen that proverb 18 before. So I understand now when the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing. There's just so much to learn. So let's ask our questions. We all know what's going on. And 
Um, I know if I ask some people to uh, to remove their Unmute. video and let's see, we okay. may have our own movies. So we don't want to see. Thank you. <laughs> but if, if you have a question about what has been taught tonight, please. I know what I'm saying. I know. I know the people I know, and the people I'm talking to, they know themselves. So, do you have any question? <laughs> What questions do you have from what I've been taught tonight? Um, the first Corinthians 13, it says the building of your love life is talking about how much you got. <laughs> Somebody said what? a God, though. A God, though. Somebody said a God, though. I don't even know that is. Who is that? Ah, it's somebody. I don't even know who that person is. <laughs> <laughs> How do we improve our relationships by the words we speak, even when we're upset? Now, let's be practical, let's be real. You're upset about something, something is not aligning as you want. How do you still build a good relationship with your words? According to this, I think, 1 Corinthians 13, I said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, hey, and the princess is here. Yeah, when I yeah. became a man, I put away childish things. How? How do you manage those heated moments and yet remember God's word? Let's talk about practicability, the practice of what has been preached. Let's do it quickly because our time is limited. Oprah, you are a first timer. Can you open the floor and tell us how long have you been married for? How have you dealt with heated moments? How have you kept the word? And if you have not, this is a safe zone to say, man, that is one thing I've learned today. I didn't know, but now I do. So the floor is yours. The person that just commented now, you may get ready. You may just dress up, okay? <laughs> or if you have a question, uh, any part you want me to go back and elaborate on, please go ahead. Yeah. Um, good evening, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, good to see you. Good evening. I've been so blessed, I've been so, I've enjoyed every bit of it. I'm sorry I came a bit late. I was like, I family baby mother, I like, can um, ask me for God. Um, what I do when we have our heated moment, for me, I just walk away and then I, I, I say things to myself and I make sure I don't say them. <laughs> I make sure I don't see them. You make sure you don't say them. Is that what you said? Yeah, I'm not hearing well, though. The, the, the bandwidth is low. Yeah. Sorry, Sister Benson. Your oh. your data. Well, your, 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 your Oprah, Oprah, if you if you hold um it's so low. The bandwidth is strength very is not so good. So please counting. type it. Type it in the Okay. Yes, honey, go on. Hey, uh, sorry. Sorry. If you can, Oprah, if you can hear me, please type what you have to say <laughs> because it's important. We all want oh, to they learn. Have turned on, the turned on their video. <laughs> ah, let me see you. Oh no, she has turned it off again. She's trying to fix her hair. <laughs> Your are <hands are. laughs> You don't be taking that girl very seriously. <laughs> I say things to uh, myself. Okay, Ioma says, I say things to myself. Mm -hmm. 
I make sure I do not say them to him during heated argument. No, okay, so if I might just typing out for us what uh, Sister Benson was saying. Okay. Okay. Yeah. She would rather say them to herself than to say to her husband. Is that what she yeah. said? During the heated argument, I say things to myself. Okay. I make sure I do not say them to him during heated argument. Awesome, awesome. That's that's practical. That's that's good. Yes, Adiza, how do you deal with heated moments in, in in if we have to practice Jesus Corinthians 13? How do we mature with our words? How practical, please want to learn? Okay, good evening, everyone. So good evening. This is our so, <laughs> so for me, I, I would I rather everything out. Come on, I, baby, I, double I, there, mom. Turn on your video. <laughs> on the letter, she has only one minute. Please, please <laughs> looking at her dear. So, Talk, <laughs> so for me, I'll everything out. I, I can hardly keep anything in because the more I keep in my heart, even when you are angry, even when you are yes, angry, I have to say. I, I, I have to say it's irrespective of how I feel because I, I will be able to sleep. Way. My heart, my heart, my heart. Mama, you taught me well. It's been five years since you and Pap joined my husband and I. So <laughs> we've but learned to be but, but <sighs> How do you now manage when those words that have come out, they seem to cut him like a knife? Okay, but I, I don't think I have those words in me. That's the first thing. I don't have them at all. Amen. I don't have, I can't say things that are hurtful to him that yeah. I can't take back. I can tell him I'm very angry. I'm pissed. I don't want to hear this. I don't want that, but I don't use curse words. I don't, so maybe over time I've been able to build myself in that regard. But if I'm upset about something, I have to say it. I can't sleep. I can't move on. I'll be so, so I'll be like bread in water. So, mm -mm. Mm, okay. <laughs> you know. Okay. So, um, you know what? You know what I appreciate about that, Adiza. It will make you guys have. You make you guys have deep, deep relationship when you can voice out a matter when uh -oh. the when it's heated. It's not everybody that can handle this, and we hardly recommend it for everybody because it has done more harm that there is no maturity than right. good. Do you understand? Yeah. That's the truth. It's done right. more harm than good to be able to vent. But I always put it this way that where there is love and understanding, and there is a foundation, there's a foundation between the two, you can learn to hear this person. And severe, I mean, that took me years. My husband, one of the things he used to say about me when I'm upset is that I generalize. And maybe you generalize when you feel you're losing out in the argument, or you just feel, why are you, why are you predating on this matter alone? Why are you not considering the many other good things I do? Why are you fixating on this yeah. one thing that I'm not doing right? And I, I probably come from a defense position to please take your eyes off the one thing I'm not getting right. Focus on everything else I'm getting right. But I realized that it brought more frustration because with, if you are getting all these other things right, we don't need to talk about them right now. What we want to talk about is that one thing you're not getting right. If you are, if, if you are getting all other things right, kudos to you. But this moment cannot be your praise moment as well. And in all fairness, that took me years to understand. Maybe there's just something in human nature that needs for you to be affirmed for your ego or whatever, to be found all the time. And this is where that maturity comes. When someone is doing their best to speak a word to you, particularly in heated times, understand, don't generalize. And we ladies are most... We are the, I don't know, well, that's what I think, because in our relationship, I'm the one who does it. Most of zone is that you can date any matter back to Genesis. Even when people are stuck in Hebrews, he will start from pre, 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 Adamic world, say, not about Genesis. He 
the world before the flood. That's where it starts from. But my own is generalization. So thank you so much, Adiza, for your two cobo. <laughs> Who else? Honey, I like the way you are behaving like the bread. Adiza, Dr. Ward, I see you swelling. <laughs> no. Adiza is the one that came out with that uh, extrapolation. So like bread is water. <laughs> Sister Bessie was like, wow, yes. that's a good one. Until she water. says what's an amen. It makes sense. We don't see the face swelling up. Abby, <laughs> ah, it's true. No, but I guess I, I also had to learn on how to, how to bring complaints without damaging the person I'm complaining about, you know, because uh, the, way you, the way you manage complaint can drive somebody into a defense mode. And of course, uh, for a lot of women, Part of that defense is what you call the blanket uh, statement. You always, you never, you are always, they don't mean it that way, but that's the only way they can defend themselves Absolutely. right now. You know. Yes. All right, praise yes. God. Who else has a question? Ask okay, you so, so today. Oni, yeah. The Proverbs 18. Yeah. Here you said, hold yourself accountable to your words, to what your words have done in your marriage. Yeah. And it just takes yeah. a lot of humility to practice. Yes, ma'am. If you, it takes a lot of humility to practice. And I want as many of us to comment on this. Hold yourself accountable to your word, to what your words have done. If we are able to practice this, we will have awesome relationship. When I am wrong, let me tell you this. When you are, you don't know when you are wrong because you are not the person going through the spoken words. Do you understand? If, let me just give a, an example. If my husband just looks at me, for example, he will never say, I'm just using it as an example. And he says, wow, honey, you have gained weight. He meant it. He will never say such a thing because he doesn't even see those things. He likes me. He likes I have, me. I have cataracts. I know, I'm just inside. using it. I, I, I like fries. Yes, size. I know. I like bread in water. Amen. Honey, it's okay. <laughs> we are not talking about you now. We are talking, please. <laughs> so I'm going somewhere. Okay. That if he makes a statement like that, to say, honey, you have put on weight. He could have said it from many angles. I'm concerned about your health. Mm. Have you observed that this is what the reality is? And now I take it is totally up to me. If I now say, wow, honey, your comments hurt me. His idea should not be to defend himself. He should hold, take hold of the word he has spoken and use it in my benefit. I don't know if I'm making sense. I didn't mean to make you feel uncomfortable. I mean, Adiza sent a video to me that I wish I even put on the face and family. The guy was, <clears throat> he works as a health consultant and he sells medicines that help women to lose weight. This is this guy's business. Now, his wife is a plus size. Only are you listening? His yeah. wife is a plus size. And the wife really, really wants to help him with his business. And in fact, this matter was in a, they were getting a divorce. That was how we got the seat, she said. She's on the plus size. She wants to assist her husband in the sale of his business. And this husband had to say to her, you can't help me, you are fat. My business is to sell a product for slim people. You are not part of my success story. I have no problem with your size, but your size is affect is going to affect my business because I must be able to sell to slim people. And I said to her, this is where communication comes. She he didn't mean to hurt her. That was not the objective. The lady divorced, she said she can't have this because if you don't love my person, if you have a problem with the fact that I'm big and you don't want me to face your clients, that means you don't love me. And I said, this is immaturity, I'm sorry. He never called you fat. He's just saying, my dear, I have bills to pay. 
This is all the product and idea God has given me to be able to pay my bills. If you show up where I'm doing this business, I can't make sales because they will say, you don't have a success story from your home. Your wife is a plus size. How can you sell slim things to us? I don't know if you understand my, my point, honey. Yeah. Do you understand yeah, the point you, I'm you making? Are selling, you are selling something that will make us slim. How come it has not made your it's wife slim down? And she could not understand that, honey. So she held on to that and she was getting a divorce. So I'm like, I'm like, well, I'm sorry. If that's what she wants, let her get a divorce because that's immaturity. We can't love everything about our spouses. Some, because we love them, we're going to have to accept it. And these are at core conversations that we're going to have. And unless the foundation is so well laid, if it's me, I would understand. I won't feature in that business because I understand you need to make money. I'm not part of your success story, so I'm going to back off. You have a problem with me being fat now. It's like you being a driver or you teach people how to drive and I don't know how to drive and I'm your wife. What do we do? I don't know how to drive. You need to teach people how to I don't feature. I don't know if I'm making sense, but well, the floor is open on this matter of take ownership of your spoken words and don't overflow matters. Who, who wants to say something about that? We have five more minutes. Uh oh. Who wants to comment on that? Uh, Honey, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, if you are the one that they... Yeah, it says- Doc, uh, where are this, you? I'll simply walk away and send them to myself. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, uh, the, the thing is- Ma'am, uh, here. Good evening, Ma. Good evening, oh, yeah, Pastor. Doc, Oh, yeah, answer the question. What would you do if it was you? Your husband says, sorry, you can't show up here. Not because I don't love you, but you're not part of the success story yet. How would you take it? What would you do? In line with our Proverbs 18, um, 19 and 20 scripture that we used. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I would certainly need to back up because, you know, the greater goal is more important than you know, whatever I, I feel at that time, especially because I know that, you know, the, um, well, it's not that the, my husband doesn't make me feel like I'm fat or he doesn't have any problem with me. And so I don't see any reason why I will make it a big deal to, you know, go to the extent of divorce. So I think, but it's, it's a bit extreme. If you know, with all the information that we have about this case, it's a bit extreme, and I think that you know the woman should back off, knowing that um, the greater good or the greater good is more important than any other thing in question here. Mm. And of course, how do we track you, you, back you, you, our words? You cannot use a broken car to market car services. You know, service yeah. your own first. You know, service yours first. You know, only this was the bad of the woman, not the bad of the man. This was I understand, the man. I, I understand yeah. that, yes. Uh, she wanted to feature in the business, but she wasn't a proper model for the product. So he said, no, you can't. Maybe what would have then happened as a middle cause of action is to ask her, would you want to take the, this medication? Would you like to try it? You know? You know, that would be worse in a, in a world of sensitive women that are making yeah. it worse. I guess people that can be Maybe pleased just can be pleased, honey. I Sorry? think people that can't, I said, I think people that can't be pleased uh -huh. just can't be pleased. Because if a man came from that angle of, do you want to use the medicine? Yeah. He's still going to go back to, you don't love me, you don't oh, love you me. you don't body. love me for my size. Now you want me to slim down. Yes. No. Okay, so the best thing is that let's separate the business from the love life. Um, if I was selling bicycles and you can't ride a bicycle, how do you help me market them? You can. Um, Sister Bentley said, if everything, about, if everything about him has shown me he loves me, one statement shouldn't wipe away the old good deeds. Awesome. She was too extreme, you know. Uh, then Ihuama says, understanding the reasons for your spouse's action without being critical, take control on how you feel and how you understand. You know, um, my brothers and my sisters, in meetings like this, I keep saying, I wish 
husband and wives will listen together so that we can all be on the same page. Words are critical to the bonding of hearts. And words are critical to growing up together and remaining fond of each other. Please hear what I'm about to say. What you said to someone in January that hurt them and, make the, and made them cry. Do you, ah, thank you. Uh, so Brother mm -hmm. Benson is also there. I'm glad he's with you. You know, what you said to someone in January that made them cry, for you to know the power of words, the person can remember the same thing in this month of June. And their mind will go into such a cinematographic replay to such an extent that they are crying again. The words were not said again, but the words just being remembered still have the capacity to still make the person cry all over again. This is how dastardly words can, uh, can be when they are misused. You know, thank you, Sister Chizoba. You know, uh, but words that are misused. So please, let's begin to take responsibility. And maybe this should be our homework. This should be our homework. When we go away from here, uh, let's go ask each other, darling, um, is there anything I've said to you in the last few years that you are still struggling with? And please hear me. If your spouse is humble enough to ask that question, please, I beg you, I beg you, come down from the high horse of your village spirit and say the <laughs> truth. No, sincerely, ma'am, sincerely, come down, say the truth. Don't say no, nothing. I said, are you sure? I said, I said nothing. If there was something I would tell you, I said there's nothing, but you know there is something. It's just that you consider that thing too big that to go to it again, to revisit that matter again, ah, it may destroy everything we have. No, it won't. There is grace from this place. There is grace from here. When they ask you, say, I'm glad you asked. Lord, help me. Pray the short prayers of Nehemiah when he was standing before the king. Oh God, give me favor before the king. And then just tell them, you remember 1917, February 28, when you said I was short. It's true. Since that time, eh, ah, I've not been able to love you like I used to because I just believe that you are managing me. I just believe that you are, you are just coping with me. Say it out. Let that person explain themselves. Let them own up, take responsibility and say, no, I meant it like this, or this was the condition surrounding what I said. This is where I am with you today. And please hear me. Once they have repented, accept their repentance and then enter into a new season together. Please hear me. I know I'm far away from my wife. I shouldn't be the one who should be proposing all this right now. But I, I'll just, uh, for Jesus' sake, I'm being magnanimous. Uh, when you guys reconcile, just try and send the children to the neighbor's house. If you have house help, tell them to go and buy crayfish from Mama Calaba. Let it be very far distance so that you guys can have at least 15, 20. Can I only your primitive yeah. Jesus yeah, crayfish, Mama Calaba? Oh. This Canada has not taken Ah, we have Mama Calaba in Toronto. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. But the point to be made is this. Go ahead, break bread, make love, you know, get some Coca-Cola from the fridge, grab a piece of bread, break bread on it. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you remember my death. And say, as we break bread right now, we expunge from our hearts, from our soul, from this relationship. And every spirit that came into this bed, that came into this home because of this word of offense, we wash it away by the blood of Jesus. Then go ahead and have koinonia. You know, make love. And scream and shout. Don't worry. They've, they've gone to Mama Calabas place to go and buy crayfish. You know, honey, why are you opening your mouth? Why are you? Because there are people who are here that are not married. 
Oh, okay. For those of you that are not married, that was for the married people. Oh, you guys leave me alone. The Bible says train up a child in the way that it should go. Let's train up the singles in the way that they should go so that when they are married, they will not depart from it. You know, anyways, um, there is grace for reconciliation uh, in this place. We prayed for you before some of you came online. We pray that God's grace, you know, will light us up on the inside and give us a new zeal to want to build a new and a better relationship. Let's not just have this haphazard marriage. You know, we are married, we are counting 33 years, but uh, we know we don't have 33 years of joy and play. Let's start playing together. Please hear me and I close with this. Let your children catch you flirting with their mom. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Let your children catch you kissing on their dad. It's beautiful. Let them know that this is where it belongs. It is safe between mom and dad. And that's the only place where it should be. In Jesus' mighty name. Anyway, if you have been blessed today, uh, let's make it a date again. Thank you, honey. Thank you so much. Let's make it a date again next Monday, 6 p.m. Nigerian time, which is 1 p.m. in Toronto right now. And uh, the meeting is for 90 minutes. It's still going to be the same link. So you can save up that link somewhere so that once it's time, you just click and it will open up to you. If you have any further need for help in any way possible, you can call my wife or you can call me, you know, on WhatsApp and I'll be so, so glad to assist you. Let me pray for you. Thank you, Sister Benson. Thank you, uh, Akban. Thank you so much. Heavenly Father, we give you praise. We give you the glory. Thank you for those who've come today, even for the first time. Thank you for the word that you have prepared. You prepare this table. Let it satisfy our souls. Let your word convert our hearts, oh God. Let there be grace released upon us as we go from here to practice your word. Let our marriages become the epitome of attraction. Let it showcase the love between Jesus Christ and his church, the Ecclesia. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you, Chizoba. Thank you all. God bless you. Have a great, great week. Uh, you are getting ready to go to bed. We are still at work here. Thank you, my in-law. Oh, thank you, Bonnie. I see the love sign. Mm, hallelujah. <laughs> and I like your new glasses, by the way. Mm -hmm. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. I thought you were not noticing. I was going to start counting your charge. Ah, no, no, no. I noticed. Babe. You want to know what else I noticed? Or you want us to go online and see what we Oh, know? it's okay. Bye, no. honey. Bye, bye, bye. No, no, bye. No. Get a room. Thank you, Get a room, honey. Thank you, Sister Bye. Tell me where to your husband. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Eh? Who was talking there? Was that Hadiza? What, what of you course say? it was Hadiza. <laughs> I said what no. Say? Get a room? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was mama, not me. Oh. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because All I right, know man. I'm about yeah. to go in for a session. <laughs> you need it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Before oh, our was colleagues there, Felix there. was Felix listening in. Felix, tell her everything. Who shall do?